I'm going to make one argument today, which is essentially that if we can understand, uh, uh, combine our understanding of networks with an understanding of social influence in networks, then we can create uh, policies that affect behavior change on a population scale. So what we've seen are examples of diseases spreading through networks, and we've seen the importance of the structure of a network to how things spread. And now what I want to talk about is how, if we can understand how one person influences their peers to change their behaviors, how we can affect uh, different types of social policy. Uh, so Mark Zuckerberg was asked two years ago at the, the Facebook conference what he thinks is the next big thing uh, in, in networks. And he replied, social commerce which is essentially uh, the use by businesses of uh, likes and shares on Facebook to increase consumer demand for products. Okay? And this was a UK wired uh, front cover which says commerce gets social and the bottom tagline is how your networks are driving what you buy. So this is an example of how if I like a product or I share some sort of information with a product, how will that change the demand for that product in my friends, in their friends, and overall in the population? But this isn't just about commerce. It's also about all sorts of social applications. So there's a, a fairly big debate now about the role of social media in the Arab Spring and how that spread from person to person or country to country. Can we think about how individuals influence their peers to get out into the square and protest? What does that mean for social mobilization, for political mobilization, for voting, et cetera? And so the basic idea that I want to convey, and it's difficult in 10 minutes to get too technical, uh, is that if we can understand how behaviors spread in a network and thus in a population, from person to person to person to person, then we can potentially promote behaviors like these, condom use, exercise, tolerance, economic development, financial stability. And we can potentially contain behaviors like these, fraud, violence, waste, hatred, poverty. And so what I do is I mine massive social network data, like some of the data that you've seen, to understand how individuals influence one another and how that influence spreads in a social network for the purposes of policy changes or uh, commercial changes to spread products or other types of behaviors. And in fact, I have this cartoon on my door in my office, and it's two friends talking. And one friend says to the other, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. And the friend says, it sounds like the class helped. And the guy goes, well, maybe. And the idea is that we need causal inference to understand how one person influences their friend to change their behavior. And this is a very difficult problem that scientists have to solve if we're going to give good advice about which policies will succeed or fail at spreading behaviors in a population. Let me give you an example or a few of them. Actually, in networks, uh, network science, this goes under the rubric of the reflection problem, which is basically that we know now that human behaviors tend to cluster in network space and in time. So people who are connected tend to do the same types of things at approximately the same times in very highly statistically significant uh, ways. But the question is, is this because of peer influence, one person influencing their friends, or is this because of alternative explanations? And let me give you an example. A very good alternative explanation for peer influence creating the spread of a behavior in a network is homophily. And homophily means that birds of a feather flock together. We tend to make friends with people who are like ourselves, and so we have the same types of preferences and interests and products or behaviors. So people who are marathon runners tend to be friends, and people who are foodies who like to eat tend to be friends, and so we might see pockets of obesity and pockets of non-obesity moving in the network. This might not be because of peer influence, one friend influencing another friend to change their level of obesity or their, their eating habits, but it could simply just be that people who are similar make friends with others uh, that have the same preferences. Another good example is correlated exposures to the same external stimuli. So we tend to make friends with people at work. 
And so if our work gives us an incentive to go to the gym to lower their health care costs, we'll have correlated exposures to those uh, stimuli. We tend to make friends with people in our neighborhoods. If a new restaurant opens up that's very good and serves fatty food, we will have correlated exposures to those external stimuli, as with our friends. And even more to the point, if we are a homophilus, that means we choose friends that are like ourselves, then we'll have the same preferences, we'll watch the same television shows, listen to the same radio broadcasts, and go to the same websites, we'll be uh, exposed to the same types of advertising and messaging, and that could cause correlations of a behavior in a network. And in fact, the key to understanding how you can intervene as a policymaker or as a manager in a network in order to change how a behavior is spreading is separating peer influ influence from homophily and correlated exposures and these other types of explanations for the clustering of behavior. And let me give you some examples. So we did a study with Yahoo of 30 million people of their consumers who were interacting on an instant messenger network sending messages to one another. And we combined that with detailed data about the adoption and use of a mobile service that they launched into the network. And we watched it as it diffused. And what Yahoo asked us was, can you tell us which of these diffusions from one person to another is someone influencing their friend to buy the product, and which of them is just correlated preferences or homophily or correlated exposures. And what we did was we devised this statistical technique to separate these things, and here's what we found. If we built a naive logistic regression to predict who's likely to adopt as a function of having friends who adopted, this is the influence curve that we would get. And this dot tells you that on the 20th day, if you had a friend or friends who adopted the product, you were 16 times more likely to adopt the product yourself. But after we applied this statistical technique that held homophily and correlated exposure constant, this is the influence curve that we got. And two things become apparent when you look at these curves. The first is what you thought was influence is really, much of it is really just observable homophily, correlated preferences in people's behavior. And the other thing is that you get this massive overestimation of influence early on and less so uh, later on in the product's life cycle. It turns out that this difference is because there's exaggerated similarity amongst people who are early adopters to a product. They're much more like each other than people who adopt the product six months later. This has tremendous impacts on the policy that you would implement to affect the spread of this product in the network. In the case, if you were given this curve and you were the chief marketing officer, you would likely try to institute a peer-to-peer -peer marketing strategy. Give people incentives to convince their friends to join them in the product. And if you were looking at this curve, you would be wrong because this is actually the measure of correct influence. The rest is correlated preferences. Given correlated preferences, what you would rather do is just segment the market based on what are the likely characteristics of individuals that would make them likely to adopt the product and send them advertising, right? And those people would be connected in the network because their preferences are correlated, but two different policies would have a very different effect on the spread of the behavior. We did a similar experiment on Facebook among 1.5 million people asking if we could design products so they're more likely to go viral in the network. And we found that we could increase product adoption by 15% by adding a $600 fixed cost change to the product. We published a paper using these randomization methods in science about how do we find the influential members of a social network to spread the behavior. And TechCrunch wrote this about this paper, Dear Clout, this is how you measure influence. And in fact, in that article, they have a very nice example. If Obama is giving a lecture or to a bunch of donors, and you want to measure his influence on the likelihood of those people contributing to his campaign, if you just measure how many people contribute, that's not enough. Because a lot of the people that come to that meeting are already highly likely to contribute. What is the change in behavior that is inspired by his action? What is the counterfactual? How many of them would have donated had they not heard that speech? That is the measure of influence. We're applying this technique to spread HIV testing in South Africa, and they are uh, making a movie about this. It's called The Social Cure. 
We're applying this technique to combat election violence in Kenya by sending messages uh, with an organization called Peace Text, which is about sending uh, positive, socially cohesive messages about reducing violence, reducing shootings and killings, especially during election time. We are working with Nike to understand how one person's running effect, uh, behavior affects their peers' running behavior. If all of their data is recorded in the shoe, shown to them, and then socialized through Facebook and other digital media, how much does it influence me to run if I know my friend is running faster, farther? And we're also working with MTV to use the power of peer influence in social networks to get people out to vote. And so my one argument is that if we combine our understanding of networks with our understanding of social influence, we can have dramatic effects on public policy. Thank you. <laughs>